So whenever I'm telling a story, uh, whether it's for the Globe or whether it's for magazines or whether it's for National Public Radio or a book, I always like to think of it in terms of scenes, in terms of moments, identify those important scenes and moments early on and then build around those. And so I, I wanted to begin tonight with, with you with a moment. Imagine Chicago, September 1933, the waning days of summer, Labor Day weekend. The city had been struggling in the grip of the Great Depression now for years, uh, with record unemployment, bread lines down the street, and, and flop houses so filled with thieves that they would steal everything from you, even your shoes. But that weekend, Labor Day 1933, was going to be different in Chicago. 400,000 people were streaming into the city by rail car and automobile. They were coming for an exciting event. They were coming for the air races. Forget about what you know about modern day air shows, you know, our polished scripted flying events. Air races in the 1920s and 30s was a real sport with winners and losers, massive jackpots for the, for the victors and also enormous crowds. It was unqu unquestionably, undoubtedly, one of the most popular sports of the time, and it was definitely the most dangerous. Inevitably, pilots flying these single propeller, open cockpit planes at a high rate of speed, just 50 to 75 feet off the ground, would crash. And they would often die right there in front of the grandstand. With dangers like these, many men believed that air racing was no place for a woman. It sounds absurd today. It's sexist, it's demeaning, clearly wrong. But in the late 1920s, it's an important remember that there were laws still on the books that forbade women from doing all sorts of things. In Rhode Island and Virginia, only the father was considered the sole legal guardian of a child. Only a father could determine a child's general welfare, religion, or education. By law, anyway, the mother had no say. In Georgia and Maryland, a father who died could will that his child or his children be raised by someone other than his wife, someone other than the mother of the children. And the mother, the wife, could do nothing to stop it. In Iowa, women couldn't run for the state legislature. In New York, they couldn't work the night shift. No waiting tables after 10 p.m., no driving taxi cabs any time of day in any major American city. Indeed, laws forbade women from working as many as 15 different professions in this time, and they denied them other basic rights too. Around this time, mid to late 1920s, a theater roof collapsed in Washington, D.C., killing a small boy. The mother wished to sue the theater company for negligence, a case she likely would have won. But laws denied her that right. Only a father could collect damages in the wrongful death of a minor. And this boy's father was already dead, meaning the mother in this case had no husband, no child, and no recourse. Women wishing to fly face similar challenges. Story in this book begins in 1927, 1928, where seven years, eight years removed from women, women winning the right to vote. There are at that time roughly 30 million registered female voters in this country. Out of 30 million adult women in this country, there are fewer than a dozen in 1928, fewer than a dozen with pilot's license on file with the Department of Commerce. That made the few women who did fly true radicals. And in Chicago, on Labor Day 1933, one of these women was about to do the most radical thing of all. She was going to race the men in her plane, whipping this machine around pylons, small towers, placed on the ground in a triangular course at a high rate of speed. She was 29 years old, divorced, and afraid of nothing. 
Her plane was so fast as to be known to be dangerous. It was built right here in Massachusetts, in Springfield, not far from here. And for a brief period of time, this particular model of plane was the kind of plane you wanted to have in the air races, even though it had killed many men before. This woman, though, knew what she was doing. She knew how to fly it. And at the end of the first lap that Labor Day in Chicago, the crowd knew it too. As she reached the home pylon in front of the grandstand, flying about 75 feet off the deck at 200 miles an hour, she banked her plane so hard, so perfectly, that it stood up on one wing. Just look at that girl, the announcer said. That was his words. Just look at that girl. Have you ever seen such a beautiful race? She was trailing the two leaders, but she was vying for third place. She was right there. And then on the eighth lap at the home pylon, a problem. The right wing of her fast plane began to buckle under the strain of the speed. Pieces of it began to rip away and flutter to the ground like so much confetti. And with the wind now whistling through the wing, she did what she was supposed to do. She peeled off course, flying away from her competitors and the crowd. She flew south toward Chicago, out over Glenview Road and Lake Avenue. She was trying to save the people on the ground, and she was struggling to gain elevation, gain altitude to save herself. Everyone now on the field in Chicago is watching the little red plane in the sky, knowing one of two things is about to happen. She is going to bail out from a dangerously low altitude, or she is going to crash. And either way, it probably wasn't going to end well. That woman's name was Florence Klingensmith. You probably haven't heard of her. Most people haven't. When we think about women in aviation in the 1920s and 30s, we tend to think about one woman, Amelia Earhart, as if she was all alone, flying solo in the sky. But in the time that Earhart flew, other women were flying with her, forming this small, scrappy squadron. 